Hey everybody, it's Dr. Eric Balkavage. We're back for another edition of the Thyroid Answers Podcast. And again, we have another guest. My guest today is Christy Weepy. She is a psychotherapist and she is an LCSW and I don't really know what it means, but she's going to tell us in a second. Christy, welcome to the Thyroid Answers Podcast. How are you doing today? I am great. Thank you so much for having me. It's a privilege to be here. So what is an LCSW? So we just get that right out of the way. <laughs> So it stands for Licensed Clinical Social Worker. We are rightfully confused. For all intents and purposes, it means I can practice psychotherapy. That's what I do all day, and I love it. Okay. So for the listeners, you may be like, come on, what, why, why are you bringing Christy in here to kind of have a discussion? And I think it's really important to hear this discussion today because when it comes to hypothyroidism, everybody knows I kind of talk through the lens of the cell danger response and think about what's happening in the body more as adaptive than broken. And we sexy things to talk about are organisms, this uh, toxins and foods, right? Is the things that are creating this cell danger physiology, this hypothyroid inflamed state in the body. But what often isn't talked about so much is how things like mindset, emotions play a role in our health and our physiology. Sure, we talk about them. We say, oh, I have depression and that's why I behave this way or I have anxiety and I behave that way. And Christy may correct me uh, along the way, but I look at those things as the as not the cause, but more as the effect, right? When we say, hey, I'm depressed, I have depression. Well, you do, but because of something maybe, or you, ha I have anxiety. Well, that's a definition that we've defined, but being created by something. So really, at the end of the day, we need to define what those things are. So this is what Christy deals with all day, every day, is how we think, how we behave, how we manifest those things. So I brought her on to kind of see like a different side than we, typically talk, talk, than we typically talk about, about what might be driving your cell danger response, your tissue and cellular hypothyroid and all the other things that come along with that um, multi-system adaptive disorders, which is like what I call it. So Christy, can you give everybody a little bit of your background? Because some people may be not quite sure what it is that you do and why you might be a great person to listen to. Absolutely. So I am a psychotherapist, but I primarily work with people suffering from chronic pain, and all other ty types of chronic symptoms and mind-body disorders. So this can be someone suffering from back pain, neck pain, leg pain, pelvic pain, but it can also be someone suffering from dizziness, chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia-like symptoms, insomnia, anxiety, depression. If you've had symptoms that are lasting and lasting, you've tried different types of traditional medical treatments and you haven't gotten the relief that you were looking for, this is the type of treatment that I see in my practice in our, our in our group practice called the Better Mind Center. So we operate from a modality that's called pain reprocessing therapy, where we help patients appraise their sensations in their body differently and respond to them in ways that are effective to break the pain fear cycle. So yes, I'm a psychotherapist, but I'm hanging with people all day who are in all different types of pain. And when we talk about pain, it could be almost anything, right? We're not, we're not just talking, hey, my back hurts or my neck hurts, but it could be I've, I've got chronic GI issues. I've got, as you said, sl sleep issues. I've, I can't get to sleep at night. So what do you see for people who have chronic, and we'll just, we'll kind of say chronic health issues, chronic pain issues, mm -hmm. when they've been to a whole bunch of different practitioners and maybe they've done allopathic medicine, maybe they've done functional medicine, maybe they've done both, and they don't seem to be able to get well, what do you see as kind of the big issues and challenges that may be driving their chronic symptoms? Perfect. So let's start with my general framework of how I understand the brain, which can include things like how we think and how we respond to things. But let's talk about my general framework in terms of how the brain intersects with chronic pain and to your point, other chronic symptoms and chronic health issues. So I have four touch points that I wanna run through briefly that I think will set us up to understand how I think about the brain as well as how I think about emotions. Mm -hmm. So first things first, this one's pretty simple. 
I believe all pain comes from the brain. And I'm not saying mind. I'm not saying head. This isn't in our minds. It's not in our heads. I'm saying the brain. All pain comes from the brain 100% of the time. If you stub your toe, your toe does not have the ability to create the sensation of pain, right? Nerves in your toe send a message up to your brain. Your brain processes that pain experience and then sends the pain sensation back down to your toe. That one's pretty simple. Second touch point. Pain is a danger signal. It warns us when something is wrong. In the case of acute injury, this is pretty simple, right? Put your hand on a hot stove. Your brain recognizes, oh, that's dangerous for you. That's dangerous to the tissues of your hand. I'm going to generate a pain sensation and send it down to the tissues of your hand so that you move your hands quickly. That works out super well when it is the case of an acute injury or an acute illness. The third touch point, and this is where we can start hitting on some new information and we can see the conversation expanding a little bit, is that pain can warn us of real physical injury, like a broken leg, a skinned knee, but it can also warn us of perceived injury. And there's a case study that demonstrates this really well that you might be familiar with, Dr. B, because it's pretty common in the chronic pain research space. It was published in the British Journal of Medicine a number of years ago about a construction worker. This construction worker, big burly guy, stepped on a nail at a construction site when he was working. He looked down to check it out, and he saw that the nail was coming up through the top of his construction boot freaked out in pain, thought that the nail had gone clear through his foot. So he was carried off the construction site, sent to the hospital. The doctors couldn't even get the work boot off because he was writhing in so much pain. They sedated him, like fully knocked him out, took the work boot off, only to realize that the nail had gone directly between two of his toes, didn't draw a drop of blood, absolutely no injury. Was his pain real? Absolutely, 100%. Where was it coming from? His foot? No, it was coming from his brain. So this goes back to the previous two touch points. Pain comes from the brain. It is a warning signal. And our brain gets warning signals wrong all the time. So it can warn us of perceived injury as well. And this is where it expands into an even broader conversation around emotional health. Because our fourth touch point is the brain can create a pain response to perceived injury of any kind. And that includes psychological or emotional stressors as well. You have butterflies before a first date, or you get a headache after a stressful day at work. Those are real felt sensations in the body, but there's nothing wrong with your stomach or your head. You don't go to the doctor. You say, I'm going through something stressful. That can happen in an acute stressor situation. It can also happen in an ongoing stressor situation. So pain can also come about when someone is experiencing ongoing emotional or psychological stress. So this is the framework from which I work. Pain is a danger signal that comes from the brain, but we can perceive danger in a lot of different ways. And it doesn't always exclusively have to do with damage to our bodies. So when you talk about pain, all right, so the the pain is the outward expression, right? I think in, in my world, we talk, sometime about nerves and the firing of those nerves, right? And we talk about mechanoreceptors. We talk like more simplistically, right? We've got mechanoreceptors. Those are giving a lot of the movement and vibrational and stimuli input to the brain to say, hey, here's what's going on. And so that the brain can then make a decision as to what to do. And then there are other nerve endings. We call what you call them nociceptors, which are irritating stimuli receptors. And sometimes in functional, in fun, from a functional neurology standpoint, we kind of sim- think about what can drive more pain perception is when we have nociceptors con- constantly firing, right? And then mechanoreceptors really only fire a lot when the tissue is moved, vibration, movement, stimulation, right? So somebody who's less active, less mobile may start to get some irritating stimuli as the result of just more aberrant, more nociception, but not necessarily even more nociception, but less mechanoreceptor function, right? So do you guys do you guys use that terminology and what you're doing, or is that maybe too too thick to be talking to people about? We would understand that framework, but we would simplify it to help the patient change their response on a moment-to-moment basis. Hey, if I had all that language, I might 
I might share it with the patient on their first session so that they understand some of the biological and um, uh, movement-based inputs that are gener that are driving their pain. When it comes to actually working with them in session, we would take a look at, well, what's happening when you're moving? What does it feel like? Not only the sensation, but what is your brain's response? Do you feel comfortable with that movement? Do you feel scared of that movement? How is that fear impacting the way that you're moving and the way that your body is feeling? So I think we understand the same um, framework, but the language that we use with patients is a little uh, more driven to the psychological conversation. So in in my, in my world, like we, it's not unusual that I'll see somebody who um, has seen a bunch of different physicians long before me, right? So I, I mean, I may be their first practitioner, but not usually. Usually they've seen four, five, six, seven, eight people ahead of time. And one of the things that actually led me to Christy, by the way, I will say this, is I have a client who has uh, chronic or had chronic neck pain. And um, it's in a bunch of PTs and chiros and everything else, and then found an app and started working on her mindset. The app was called Curable, and I you're related to, to not related to Curable, but associated with Curable. Um, yeah. and by working on that, she was like, All my pain is gone, my neck pain, my chronic neck pain is gone. So in that situation, we had already had a discussion, like maybe if you've seen so many people that are really good, physical therapists and chiropractors and orthopedists, and you can't get better, you know, I think the thought process was it's in her head, right? And my thought, my thought process was it's not necessarily in your head, but it is, how do we, how do we, it's not, you're not making it up. No, it's a real pain, but yeah. something is triggering it. Something non-physical is creating it. We see this in somebody who's got a gallbladder problem could have chronic right upper back pain, right? Somebody who has an organic mm. issue can have referral of pain. Um, but again, the same thing goes that organ has irritation. It sends signals to the homun this thing in your brain called your homunculus that has a sensory uh, distribution up there and it says, oh, that signal is coming from this area, therefore, that's the area that's going to, I'm going to alert the body that that thing hurts and we need to get pressure or do something about it, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yes, and you're bringing up such a good point around all of the different treatments that someone might try before they end up in front of you or end up in front of me or end up using the Curable app. That's a really scary process. The diagnostic and treatment process in and of itself is extremely stressful. Yeah. Um, it is stressful that that could add another layer to maybe their chronic conditions. So how do we go about, how do you go about looking at somebody and making a decision? Is something going on in their mind or in their brain mm -hmm. triggering it more responsible for their physical manifestation, whether it's organ manifestation whether it's inflammatory stuff, whether it's a gut issue, how do you go about making that determination? Is this something that is an active problem, trauma, injury, versus this is something that hap that is, maybe it's a past trauma, or maybe it's a belief that's mm -hmm. creating the problem? Great question. So, our first order of business when we're working with a patient is to understand the source of their symptoms. Is the source, to your point, the language that we use, is the source of their pain or their symptoms structural? Is it pathological? Do they need medical support? Have they done all the traditional medical treatments and tests recommended by doctors? We want to make sure if someone has back pain, they don't have a tumor. We want to make sure if someone has fatigue, they don't have an autoimmune disease that hasn't been treated. So we want to make sure someone's been really thorough, thorough with their medical rule outs. But if someone ends up in front of me after six months, a year, years of chronic pain and symptoms, if their symptoms have moved around or generalized over time, if they seem like they're a person with high nervous system activation, they might be in a stressful situation or relate to themselves with a lot of stress, 
these clients are often very motivated and they want to get better, but they're often also very fearful. These are clues that start telling me the brain might be at play here. And when we're taking a look at the brain being at play, we open the door to something that we call, again, in my field, neural circuit symptoms, neural circuit pain or neural plastic pain. Pain that is coming from the brain and perpetuated by brain processes. And where we really dive in here is taking a look at how fear impacts and in some situations creates pain sensations. And there's a couple different uh, scenarios that I want to walk through that might demonstrate this a little bit clearer. So we have some clients who come in and they've had a precipitating injury. Let's say that someone had back pain or neck pain from a car crash months or even years ago. When someone is in chronic pain, fear is a natural response at the beginning, right? Fear is an important response to pain. It helps direct and focus our attention to the area of our body that needs help or rest or medical attention. But what can often happen with clients as they go through this the situation of chronic pain, they don't really know when to start paring back on that fear response. The worry and the vigilance with which they're relating to their symptoms becomes habituated for them. So at some point, their illness might heal or start healing. Their injury might heal, but they, the client has a difficult time letting go of the fear response. The worry remains, the vigilant re vigilance remains because it's become habituated, right? They think about their pain and their symptoms first thing when they wake up. Their mind gravitates to it multiple times throughout the day. They worry if do they have the right treatment team. They worry about how this is going to impact the quality of their lives. So what can happen in these situations is the nervous system activation is so high that the brain is incapable of neutralizing that threat detection system that perpetuates pain. So the injury can heal. The body can start feeling better. But the fear response becomes the sole driver of the pain experience. So the pain can continue far past the point of the injury or the illness clearing. And that's when we need to take a look at the person's response to their body and increasing a person's sense of felt safety in their body. Okay. So I want to kind of unpack that a little bit. And for the listener, here's what I think is really important. Like, one of the things that's important, without a doubt, you could have... When, when when Christy's talking about pain, we're I, I, what I want you to do is hear that's of cell stress or cell danger. That's what I want you to kind of hear, right? Because that's triggering that, oh, bang, I got to shift my physiology from manufacturing to protective mode, right? And that's kind of what we're talking about here. And you could have a real issue happen, right? Uh, let's say I, I, I had some dysbiosis in my bowel and I got some irritation and GI problems and um, I got irritable bowel, I got loose bowels and you start to be, have this constant worry about, oh my gosh, what am I going to do? How am I going to plan my day? I got to, I got to figure out everywhere I'm going to go so I can go to the bathroom. And, and this becomes how you think chronically and, and constantly. And right. And so now this becomes the operating mode. And because you're in that operating mode, you're kind of facilitating a certain stressed behavior on the physiology that continues to manifest itself as dysfunction, even though the thing, maybe the organism, maybe the toxin, maybe the food that initially created the problem is gone. Maybe you've done your GI protocol to support your GI tract, but yet you still have that symptomatology. Is that that's say. exactly it. Yes, that's exactly it. And listen, I feel for these people. There's no, there's no one that comes in and says, hey, you've done a fantastic job advocating for yourself and worrying about your body because you care so much about your health. Just so you know, now is the point where you can actually start neutralizing that danger signal. Like you can start worrying less. There's no one there walking someone through that process. So people with real physical issues who care very deeply about their health it's natural that they're having a worry response to their symptoms. They just want to feel better. And it's hard to know when can I start letting my foot off the gas pedal on that worry and trust that my body is starting to heal. That's a, that's really difficult for people. Yeah. And how do we, how do we get that person? How do you walk that person through the idea that, okay, 
I need to change or I can I can slow down that stress behavior, that stress response. And for the listener, like you'll hear me talk about this all the time. Like, and I use the analogy of somebody broke into my home and attacked my child, right? I and I fought them off. It doesn't mean we're going to go back to Kumbaya tomorrow or even that day or even that week or even that month. I'm going to be, you know, double checking the doors every day, looking outside before she goes out. You know what I mean? I'm going to be overly obsessive about this. And at some point I have to realize that, hey, this was a once one time thing. It's probably not going to happen again. How do we talk ourselves out of that process? Right. And somebody might say, well, mm -hmm. it sounds easy to you, but this is a real thing for me. So how do you. How do you work somebody through that process? Yeah, it starts with a massive amount of normalization of how they got to this point, right? This We want to be really clear when we start talking about the brain's involvement in our health experiences and our pain experiences, when we start talking about a person's response to their body contributing to their health experience, we really need to be careful about normalizing and validating. And I hear you doing this, Dr. B normalizing and validating how they got to this point of worry. This is not someone coming in and creating their symptoms and just, I'm an anxious mess and now my body is falling apart. Mm -hmm. There's a reason why they're anxious. Mm -hmm. It is a normal protective response. But we, the more that we can educate someone on why that stress impacts pain, how it impacts pain and other health issues and get them to see, oh, I do see myself in this description. I do think about my symptoms first thing when I wake up. And that is stressful to me. I do notice my, gra my brain gravitating to fear thoughts throughout the day. Of course I do. I don't know how to get through my lunch meeting. I don't know how to go on this date. I don't know how to take care of my kids. That is stressful for me. The more that we can help them see how frequently their brain gravitates to this worry and this pressure, the more they're going to be bought in on understanding Hell yeah, this is stressful. This has been awful. So it's a, it's an education and a validation that helps start that patient's awareness process of just how much not only the symptom has infiltrated their life, but the stress has infiltrated their life. And once we get that buy-in, when they can see the connection, then they feel more comfortable taking a look at their stress response because hopefully they're not feeling blamed in any way and they're feeling motivated to get themselves not only to a place of physical comfort, but again, of, of psychological and emotional comfort. I can start to trust my body again. I, I think to some degree we have, and especially when it comes to immune issues and autoimmune issues because that's a lot of when we talk about what's what's driving hypothyroidism in this in this country you know 90 95 percent of the cases are thought to be immune driven and i think we do a really bad job of helping people in this situation because we tell people that your immune system has become dysregulated and it's attacking you right. and i think that's a terrible thing to say to somebody a mm -hmm. I don't think it's necessarily accurate in most cases. I typically look at immune-driven processes, again, an adaptive response. Something's threatening me. I'm upregulating the immune system, and the immune system is out there looking for whatever that threat is and trying to neutralize it. So if we tell somebody that they are, you have an autoimmune condition, there's nothing you can do about it, it's, your immune system is out of control, why wouldn't that create a certain mindset and a, a set a certain set of hopelessness right where like what am i gonna do i gotta deal with this every day and and have that <laughs> emotional concern and worry big time i uh, am horrified by some of the things that my patients have told me that their doctors have told them about their health the messaging about their health and their prognosis and it can be coming from good intentions. I mean, doctors and other people in the medical field who want to take good care and offer a warning, but the impact of that, and I remember this because I was a chronic pain patient myself. I had, I mean, I had symptoms from head to toe, including not just pain, but uh, dizziness and vertigo and some insomnia. I was, I had a lot of things going on. And my doctors told me the craziest thing. They were like, your bones are, I was 20. They were like, your bones are twice the age they should be. And I was like, well, I'm 20. So that means my bones are 40. So when I'm 40, my bones are going to be 
80. <laughs> it looks, they just gave me the way like, your neck is where your neck is the longest I neck me. Your neck is like a giraffe. I've never seen a longer neck. I was like, well, I feel like my neck is normal. Like they just, they want to have a reason why you're hurting. It's coming from good intention. So they're trying to make sense of this person sitting in front of them whose pain is off the charts. But unfortunately that often leads to some very inaccurate descriptions of their pain and a lot of fear messaging and it is totally unhelpful and so you this is so what you're typically seeing is the person who's had more chronic pain scenarios more chronic health scenarios which is a lot of the patients that we see so step one for you is to help just get them to what talk about their situation and try and uncover their story, their history. Is that, is yeah. that about? So there's that. Thank you. Relating into kind of a good explanation of the two prongs of treatment from where we're sitting. So yes, we want to help them understand the way that fear impacts their symptoms, right? So again, that's where the validation and the education comes in and we have them start noticing the way that they think about their body in a fearful way, the way that they move their body in a fearful way. And we want to do some work on helping them respond to sensations in their whatever the sensation is, right? It can be dizziness, fatigue, pain, gut discomfort. We want to help them learn to respond to those symptoms in a less fearful way. And we can talk more about that if we want. Mm -hmm. But there's a whole nother side of treatment. And this is where I remind people because they sometimes forget when they come in and we're doing all this health chat. I'm like, I just want to remind everyone, I'm a psychotherapist. So we're also potentially going to be taking a look at where does fear and stress live for you in relation to all things, not just in relation to your symptoms and your body, what you respond to your body, but also how do you respond in general to yourself, to your relationships, to the world around you? Where does fear live there? And how did you learn to respond that way? So that's where some of the kind of broader, wide in the lens talk might come in. Okay. So let's go with, let's just talk about fear. What is it? Somebody might say, well, I'm not fearful of anything. Mm -hmm. So how do you define fear? And how do you define how it might impact somebody? I'm so glad you asked that. I use the word fear specifically. I don't just say stress. People are like numbed out to the word stress. Like, oh, I'm, how are you? I'm stressed. How are you? I'm busy. How are you? I'm stressed. I'm doing all this stuff. We get a little bit numbed out to that. And then we're not bought in. We're not committed to changing it. I use the word fear on purpose. I feel like as we age and we stop being kids, we forget that fear and being scared is something that we still go through. So I want to use the word fear and I want to look at where people are scared. There are flavors of this that don't just look like explicit panic about your symptoms. These clients, generally speaking, again, are very high functioning. They're motivated. They're not coming in, oh, I'm an anxious mess. They're coming in saying, I really want to get better. So their fear flavor might look like frustration. They might say, no, I'm not afraid. I'm just so sick of this. I'm frustrated. I don't want to feel this way anymore. It might look like avoidance. I don't know how to get better. I don't even want to think about this anymore. I just want to stay in my bed. I just can't think about this anymore. So the fear can have different flavors, frustration, agitation, uh, hesitation with movement. But I want everyone to bring it back to the word fear. Because fear is what we know without a doubt impacts pain levels. There's boatloads of research on how fear, pain-related, fear thoughts, pain catastrophization, fear avoidance and movement. There's boatloads of research on how that increases pain, pain levels, disability, and depression. So I want to get someone bought in on this isn't just, quote unquote, stress. Everyone has stress. You specifically likely have a fear response to these awful sensations that you're feeling. Yeah, I like that because people talk about, oh, stress is bad. No, it's, we stress is part of an adaptive system. We need to stress the system. Uh, I, you know, every day when I'm working out, I'm stressing my physiology mm -hmm. and I do that so I can break it down a little bit and I'm bigger and stronger the next day, right? So you have to have some stress on your system. Too much or too little, more than you can adapt to is potentially more problematic. But fear, may be different from the stress because fear is how you interpret maybe in a situation. I think Tony Robbins used to talk about false emotions appearing real. And the only Ooh. problem I had with that definition was, I don't know that it's false emotions. I think the emotions are real emotions. <laughs> yeah. 
but they may be based on a false premise. Yes, that's a wonderful right? way of saying it. Because, uh, and usually the analogy I give to people about their mind, their emotional fitness, their mindset fitness is if I'll ask them, do you enjoy speaking in front of a crowd? No. Okay. So if I said, we're going to go speak in front of a crowd of 4,000 people right now for an hour and a half, how would you be? Oh, they would probably pass out, puke, pee themselves, poop themselves, right? <laughs> you, you know, whatever, right? Perspire. They do all the peas. And it's not even a real thing yet, right? It's just a perception of something and their physiology totally changes. And so for the listener, if you think about what you think about, changes your physiology. And that's why we're having this discussion with Christy, because when we, when we, what we think about typically manifests as a physical change and a chemistry change an emotional change, a psychologic change, and that can be really good or it can be extremely problematic. The real, something could physically create, realistically create a problem. Sometimes it's not a real thing, but just the thing we turn into a real thing in our mind. Is that correct? I'm getting excited because it's interesting the way that we're at different, uh, we're, we're on different sides of the spectrum, right? Like we're in different camps, you and I are fields of study, but there's mm -hmm. so much where we intersect in, in regards to perceived threat, perceived injury. Again, it can be actual damage to the body. Pain and symptoms can come about from actual damage to the body. It can also come about from perceived damage to the body, think the construction worker. And super important to me from where I'm sitting, it can also come about from perceived psychological and emotional injury. And I also, I want this, you can tell me if this applies to your patient population or not, but I think it's important to mention, not everyone I work with has a precipitating injury or illness because pain and other symptoms can come about irrespective of that. When we talked about that example of butterflies in your stomach before a first date or a tension headache after a stressful day at work, no one really goes to the doctor for that because they're like, I'm stressed out. I'll feel better tomorrow. But what if you're in a situation that's not an acute stressor? What if you're going through a very difficult life transition? Or what if your relationships are particularly strained or traumatic, or you have a really strange relationship to yourself? You put a ton of pressure on yourself. You're very critical of yourself. That's the type of nervous system activation that keeps your brain in chronic threat detection mode. And all kinds of symptoms can come about when you're in chronic threat detection mode. Are the symptoms real? A hundred percent. You're feeling them. They're real. They're happening. Are they coming from a place in your body where there's a perfect corresponding pathology or structure? That 100% does not need to always happen. Yeah, I, I and I totally agree with that. I mean, um, it is easy to manifest physical changes. And so I think that's the important part, right, is that oftentimes we're looking for that external thing that's causing us harm or danger. And many times it's our own mindset that's actually triggering those things, the fear around food the fear of movement that could hurt my back that, that's going to hurt my back how do you know yeah well I, I just know right you know we see it in small doses when my kids were young right we're going to have this i don't like that how do you know because i just know right and so you can convince yourself right my belly hurts my head hurts my whatever i know if i go there uh, i'm going to have to i'm going to have a bowel issue so i i, I just can't go right and they get and now, you know, they, so, so much analysis, of, but they get, and they get, wind up getting paralysis. So how do we help that person like unpack that? Yeah, I don't know. I, I say sometimes stinking, thinking, right. And I, sometimes with my clients, I think I saw, I read this once um, that men on average say about 300 words to themselves on a daily basis. And that wow. women say about 3,000 words to themselves <laughs> on a daily basis. And so I used to use that a lot in presentations 
like what the hell are you women saying to yourselves right (laughs) on a daily basis we're worried about what's somebody else or what externally might do but we got to be really cautious and it doesn't happen just to women it happens to men too when we're when we're overly thinking about this you and i before we got on here we were talking about uh i had a jaw issue and a tooth issue and i can tell you uh, the more i focused on that pain the worse it got right Mm -hmm. and the days and when i could change my thinking and thought process the pain was a little bit better. It's still there. It's a real physical problem, but it was better. Even going to work out in the morning, you would be like, well, if your jaw hurts and your tooth is hurting, why would you go lift and strain? But while I was working out, pain was better, Yeah. right? So it was, you know, mindset's not on it, not thinking about, not focusing on it, focusing on something else. It's a real real injury right now problem, but because my mind wasn't as focused on it, I didn't have as much pain. I didn't have as much spasm. Now I get done. I come back to my desk. I relax. I'm not, you know, I'm starting to do work and now I can feel pain. And now my brain goes right to my pain in my jaw. And then it starts some of that thinking, thinking that goes on mm-hmm. in your brain, right? Man, that hurts. Oh, if this gets worse, if it, right. And that type of thinking. And some people can do that every day. The last thing I want to do before I let you jump in here a little bit more is I want to make sure I talk about this a lot and you mentioned it and I wanted to bring it up. You talk about a lot of times people can't, aren't aware of the thing that created the problem. And we see this all the time and it's it's usually not a thing or it's not the thing that people think it was. And so it's usually the load. And I think you were, that's exactly what you were talking about. And for the listener, the regular listeners of my podcast, they know I talk about stress, not that like two cinder blocks and a board going across and we go through life and that board is like, maybe it has a capacity, let's say it has a capacity for a hundred pounds. And as I go through life, different stressors that as I go through life are like five pound weights stacking on that board. Sometimes I'm putting 40, 50 pounds on and then I, take 20, 30 pounds off and we're back and forth and back and forth. But the person who's continually adding stress to that board, that those weights to that board and not pulling some of that stuff off, what happens then is you exceed capacity of the board and you put that last five pounds on that pushes you to 105 pounds and the board breaks and you think, hey, that last thing was the thing that did it. And maybe even start blaming that going forward as the thing, right? I ate that and that's when everything went to heck. So that's, or I was exposed to mold and na- then I started having all my chronic illness and now uh, it, it, I have chronic mold issue. Well, maybe you don't. Maybe that was just the thing that was identified, but maybe you had all that load building up and you exceeded capacity and that puts you into danger physiology. Do you look at it from this? I think that's what you were saying before. Yeah, that's an incredible analogy. I'm going to pocket that later. I'll credit it back to you when I start using it with my patients. Sure, sure. It's an incredible analogy. And it speaks to put it back into the framework from which I work just so that I can think it through here with you. We talk about those two prongs of treatment when we're working with someone. There's the symptom-specific response. So that might have to do with what's the thing that pushed you over the edge? What's your active current symptom? How are you thinking about it? What are the ways that we can change how you're thinking about it? Change your focus, like you were saying, get you to lean into positive sensations in your body or positive activities in your life. That's kind of how we're thinking about things. But then when we widen the lens, when we look at the other prong of treatment, which is sort of how a person relates to fear and emotions and their lives and, and, and in general, this is when the conversation widens to how did we end up in this position? (laughs) It's not just how you're responding to your body in this moment, to your symptoms in this moment, but how do you respond to yourself and the world around you? And is there some, uh, some work that we need to do around your relationship to feeling in general, not just how you feel in your body, this pain sensation, this fatigue sensation, this gut discomfort sensation, but feelings and emotions in general are often something that people have struggled with in their load, part of that load that can lead them to flip to that last thing, like that's the mold that flipped me over. Oftentimes our relationships to feelings in general and emotions in general play a really big part. So 
let's talk about that a little bit more because so, some people some people worry about everything right and i think that's kind of along the lines of what you're talking about this could happen that could happen the kind of a worry mind and other people not a care in the world right mm -hmm. so how do you what do you see as the big factors that cause some people to i guess worry more is that the right terminology for you yeah well if why don't we talk about feelings in general for a second sure. and this yeah. you can we can bounce back and forward on how um you think about this now i think about this but my good friend daniel lyman says feelings are called feelings for a reason they're not called thinkings so mm -hmm. we work in treatment with patients not just to think to take a look at how they're thinking about their symptoms but how they are feeling in general and feelings are something that our brain when we talk about our brain can perceive things as threatening and anything that we perceive as threatening can cause pain and symptoms feelings are emotions are actually one of the things that our brains most frequently classify as dangerous and scary. So there's a big relationship between feelings, nervous system activation, and symptomology. Emotions are made to feel unsafe for a lot of us growing up. If we have a wonderful relationship with emotions, they move, they groove, they ebb, they flow, they come and go like hunger and thirst throughout the day. We feel them in our body, we attend to them, we move on. That's not how a lot of us relate to feelings in our body, to emotions at large. A lot of us have learned over time that the sensation, the felt experience of emotions is something that is scary for us. If you had a rage, rageaholic father growing up who just yelled at you at random, mm -hmm. it makes sense that anger would be scary for you. If you had a narcissistic mother who couldn't celebrate any of your victories or celebrate you and for any good thing that you did, it would make sense that happiness is something that you struggle with. If you had the best caretakers on earth, your childhood was amazing, you love your family dearly, but they were out working all day to provide for you, you might've felt lonely and that sadness wasn't validated. Then sadness is something that you learn to be afraid of. And over time, if we learn that one emotion is scary and hasn't been validated and we haven't been sat with, someone hasn't sat with us and taught us how to deal with that emotion, we can generalize that out to all feelings in our body feel scary. And when we start avoiding one feeling, we start avoiding all feelings. There's a direct impact on our nervous system. It's extremely anxiety provoking to be bracing against feeling all the time. Imagine if you just had to ignore your hunger cues all day, every day. Mm -hmm. That would be incredibly stressful on your body. Be, you, the piece of you would always be feeling I'm hungry and a bigger piece of you would be saying, that's too scary, don't touch that. That's how emotions work. They're always moving through us, little and big, and it's an incredible load on our nervous systems if we've been taught to avoid them. And we know what happens when our nervous system is activated, threat detection mode cannot turn off, we are primed to experience the perpetuation of symptoms or the onset of symptoms. So sometimes when I'm working with someone with chronic pain or chronic illness, they'll say, I don't want to get into all of that, like emotions, I don't know, I want to talk about this mold sensitivity that I have. Mm -hmm. And as we widen the lens, we realize we can't really have one conversation without the other, because there is likely a strong avoidance of feeling that is causing nervous system activation that is contributing to that load that you were discussing that flips us into that chronic symptomology. So the the... I'm going to just use the term I typically use is their reduced emotional fitness and yeah. their lack of wanting to deal with certain emotions or be comfortable with certain emotions, create a sense of stress and anxiety on the system that can trigger that cell stress response that could create a increase or decrease in an immune system that then makes them more reactive to a substance an organism, a toxin, or something along those lines. Exactly. Yes. And so I use this probably and 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 talk about this with my clients, maybe not as eloquently as as you're expressing it. But when we when I see somebody who let's use mold because we brought it up, who has the belief that they have chronic mold toxicity. They live in the same environment as three or four other people who have no re reactivity or response. The house has been remediated. They've been through four, five, six, seven treatments, right? Um, something else 
is going on there. And that's the point I'm trying to go. Listen, these are great. These are all good practitioners. But how many times can you do a gut treatment? How many times can you, if you've, if you've been treated for SIBO, you know, 14 times, it's probably the, the terrain is the way it is because of something else, right? Mindset, emotion, something else, right? Mm -hmm. The person who struggles with chronic reduced metabolism, I call it tissue hypothyroidism, despite being medicated, despite getting T4, despite getting T3, it's not, it, it's an adaptive response. We need to start, we have to look at all aspects of health, right? The sexy things are the, are the EBV and everything else, but those things are finding an environment that's conducive for them to thrive. And that that's where I really try and get people to, to take in, into consideration what's going on between the six inches of their ears, right? Because that may play a big role. And I, and, and that's what we're talking about here is maybe there, there was a real thing, but now I'm, it's not there anymore, but my fear, my la either the fear of that or the fear of some other thing, past trauma, experiences, emotions, family upbringing, um, causes us to behave a certain way. And because we didn't want to deal with it, it manifests some other way in our physiology, right? Beautiful. That's such a beautiful way of summarizing all of that and all that you can see where all these things converge. And I, the language I use is it converges that nervous system activation, but I think we say really similar. I think that kind of lands for each of us, that cell danger response, nervous system activation is where all of these pieces converge, how we respond to our treatment, how we respond to our symptoms, how we respond to our body, but also how we respond to all things, emotions, past trauma, present day stressors. And you said something about um, adaptive responses. We see that also from a psychological point of view as well, like emotional avoidance, avoidance of feeling is absolutely an adaptive learned response. I don't think people come into the world being like, I don't, I don't want to do feelings. I'm not doing that. In fact, kids are a beautiful look into free flowing emotional experience. I have a three year old. That girl is wild. Like I can be her best friend and give her ultimate bliss. And five minutes later, she literally hates me because I said no more ice cream. And then five minutes later after that, she's sobbing because her friend has to go home. She's running into my arms and hugging me. Mm -hmm. Wow. That girl does not repress anything. But not a lot of us get the opportunity to feel that safe in big feelings as we go through all of our life. So we learn to do one of two things. We emotionally suppress with an S when we mm -hmm. suppress emotions. We know that an emotion is there, but we actively and consciously push it down. So I could imagine I'm in a business meeting. Something's not going my way. I'm feeling ashamed or disappointed in myself. Tears start forming but I feel like it's not a particularly safe area for me to express that sadness. So I kind of blink back my tears, push the sadness down. I suppress it. I know I'm sad. I also know consciously that I'm pushing it away. That's suppression. We also deal, deal on a chronic basis with emotional repression within R. And when someone is emotionally repressing their feelings, their brain has gotten so good at the early detection of feeling, the early detection of emotion on its way up that the brain sends the feeling away before it ever enters that person's conscious awareness. They don't even know that sadness was coming up or happiness or anger. And I listen for this with my patients when they say things like, I don't think I have a problem with emotions. I just don't think I'm not emotional of a person. That clues me into, well, that tells me something, right? Like perhaps your emotional spectrum isn't one to 10, it's four to six. That's a protective adaptive response. Or people who say, uh, I'm just kind of even keeled. Like, I actually think I'm really good with my emotions. I'm just really even keeled. Maybe, or maybe that is an adaptive response to big feelings being something that's scary for them. Yeah. And, and I, yeah, I, I definitely see a lot of people who are just like stoic, right? And mm -hmm. you're like, um, something's going on in there, right? Hello. And then, yeah. Right. And then with the person who's kind of, erratic we go okay something's wrong right mm -hmm. but person who's always stoic you always have you also have to say hey something else is going on and to me 
the, the chronic giggler about things that shouldn't be giggled about. Like you're like, something's not right there. Right. Yeah. And again, again, and that may be their way of dealing with, I'm upset. I'm angry. I can, I don't know if repress it is the right word, but mm -hmm. to exchange the emotion like, Oh, I'll, I'll laugh my way through it. But um, I don't think we're good at it. I, I really just don't, I think we've shut, I mean, I, you know, I definitely growing up, we, you know, in my world, it wasn't about like, showing emotion or anything. All that stuff was weakness, um, mm -hmm. toughen up, right? Always don't cry, whatever, right? Yeah. It was, we didn't, we didn't show emotion. And so mm -hmm. I don't know that a lot of people are really good at knowing how to work with it or deal with it, which probably needs to be the next thing we talk about is how do we go about addressing it or dealing with it? Mm -hmm. Obviously we need, sometimes we need some, we may need help to identify that we have a problem with our emotional fitness, but how do we go about dealing with it? Like what are some mm -hmm. of the skill sets or tools that people can, I guess, what should alert somebody that their emotional fitness is maybe, maybe needs some work? What would be like mm -hmm. a couple key things that might clue the listener in? Like, I think I have a chronic mold issue, but now that we hear they're hearing this go, well, maybe it could it be some type of emotional fitness issue. That's the problem. What are some of the clues that somebody might keep an eye out for to say, hey, this is a piece I need to really take a look at? Yes. So uh, I love also that you're bringing up not only what happens in an individual person's body, not only what happens in their family system, but the societal system messages that we've been given over time in our society, in our culture, and also just in different communities and identities, right? There's there's a lot, this is a complicated discussion for another day, but there are a lot of broader reasons why feeling emotions and showing emo emotions, not only in a given person, but in their society, culture, or identity can feel unsafe. So thank you for bringing that part up. And to answer your question, how can I clue into, huh, maybe there's something going on with my emotions. There's a couple things that I'd ask people to think about. One, we've already mentioned, like if you're someone who, feels like they live from a four to six, right? That might look like, it might mask actually as I'm I am very calm, I'm stoic. I don't have much going on. I'm, I'm so good with my emotions that I'm always balanced. I'm even keeled. Again, maybe, maybe that person's done a lot of work to be so in touch with their emotions that they're free flowing. But if they're showing up in our offices with a lot of chronic health issues, that would clue me into that's an adaptive response where they are numbing out a lot of their feelings. And that numbing is extremely stressful on their bodies. So I would want someone to think, uh, listen for that. And then on the flip side, the fear piece really matters here. Fear, chronic levels of fear are an important indication that someone might be having trouble accessing their feelings. This is from my conceptualization, and you can have a hundred different therapists give their two cents on this, but I do not classify fear as an emotion. I classify fear essentially as a blockage to emotion. Fear is a threat state. If I'm running from a lion, that's not a great time for me to cry about the fact that I'm running from a lion. That's a great time for me to go. Fear mobilizes us. Fear is a threat state. It's the absence of feeling. It's not until I outrun that lion that I can process the experience of being chased by a lion. Wow, that was terrifying. I'm angry that that just happened to me. I'm sad that no one helped me. Emotions come later. Fear is a threat state. So I don't consider fear an emotion. Why do I bring that up? If you're someone who feels a lot of fear, feels constant levels of worry, that might be a clue that we're not getting to the emotions. We're stuck in this constant fear state. That's not a feeling. That's the absence of feeling. So that's another big clue. Okay. So, and I, and I, I like that thought process. It, fear is the blockage to dealing with emotions, right? Mm -hmm. it's because I got that part. How do you, how do you, because we, we talk about fight, flight, fight or flight, freeze, mm -hmm. fawn, right? 
Yeah. So where did those things, those are all, would you say those are all blocking mechanisms too? Yeah. It's just yes. a different way we block those. I don't want to have to deal with it. So I'm just going to put on my happy face and yes, just, just great deal. question. Absolutely. Right? All of those are fear responses, which can happen in response to external stressors, external trauma, things that are happening to us. And those things can happen to things happening inside of us. You can have a freeze response in emotion in response to sadness. You can have a freeze response in response to happiness. Like Those are all things that can also be responses to internal feelings as well. Okay. So if you're the flat person who's stoic, you don't, you don't laugh much, you don't cry much, you don't show much emotion at all about anything, there may be some repression going on or you use repression and what was the other one yeah or suppression with an s when you're Re doing it on purpose repression or suppression if you're the person who's we'd say the person who's uh excessively emotional or mm -hmm. no that's a really good question so sometimes and i there's a couple things i'd want people to listen for if their emotions are kind of all over the place we might not be dealing with suppression or repression we might be dealing with an emotional regulation issue they might not have learned uh they might not have had the help they needed when they were younger I think again about the kind of toddler from three Because as much as it's beautiful when my child can go through that rainbow of emotions, I also need her to be able to learn how to regulate them a little bit more. So we might be dealing with an emotional regulation issue. But another thing to look for is um, crying and that kind of constant um, state of overwhelm it can look like someone is all over the place feeling sad, feeling upset. But that level of overwhelm can actually just be fear in disguise. Like sometimes people are crying, not because they're in touch with sadness, but because they're really scared. Kids cry when they're scared. So sometimes that um, excessive, what looks like excessive emotion can actually just be a manifestation of excessive fear. What's well, a person, and I, I would guess the person who's always worried about everything, right? Like. The mom who's like, oh, well, I got. I'm worried about where they're going to go and how they're going to do it and who they're hanging out with and who this is that. Is that sometimes misplaced or improperly dealt with emotion mm -hmm. as well? Yeah, yeah. Because all of that is thinking. You're thinking constantly. Your mind is jumping to. I'm worried about being a good enough mom. I'm worried about setting enough setting up enough play dates. I'm worried about what I said at that PTO meeting. You're you're jumping from cognitive related worry to cognitive related worry. Thought 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 thought. Thoughts are a fantastic avoidance mechanism to feeling. So you got the thinking brain and you have the feeling brain. And if I just spend all my time thinking about everything that can go wrong, I don't have to worry about the emotional. Yeah. the emotion behind it or why exactly. would I be so in somebody who's like, I'm, I'm worried about this. I'm worried about that. Then you're, you might have to break them down and say, what's you'd have to unpack that somehow. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We'd have to regulate their nervous systems enough to even know what might be underneath it. Anxiety is not a comfortable place for people to be, but it is in some ways preferred Biologically, again, I don't think people really think this because they don't like being anxious, but on a biologic level, it is in some ways preferred to intense emotional experiences. Getting stuck in worry-based thought, again, it's not comfortable, but in some ways that's an adaptive avoidance response to sitting in greater levels of intense feeling. So for the person who, I, and we probably all know that person who just seems to create chaos, a lot. Do you look at those people as, I mean, they could be the nicest person, but they just love to have chaos around them. You would probably look at that maybe again as what are they avoiding? Like what mm -hmm. are they, what, what is going on that they're creating this, maybe I'm saying this the wrong way, but this uncomfortableness is their state of comfort. Because yes, as yes, long as I'm in this chaos, as long as I'm fighting against yeah. Joe or Bob or Janie or whoever, I don't have to deal with what's going on inside here. Is that how you look at it? 
yes, not only that, but what if it's not, if as long as I'm fighting Joe and Bob and Janie, what if it's as long as I'm concentrated on my next appointment for my neck pain, as long as I'm tracking every little change in sensation from my gut discomfort or my dizziness, as long as I'm tracking it, as long as I have another appointment to go to, as long as I have a next step, that, that's where that intersection is between chronic symptomology and difficulty with emotions and emotional health. The symptoms can become the container. The symptoms can become the avoidance mechanism. So that's where that intersection is. Yeah. And I, I think there, I, I think people find, even though it's uncomfortable, they, people find it an uncomfortable, they find a comfort in their uncomfortableness. This mm-hmm. is how I, this is how I, it's how I always am, right? This is the thing I know is my pain. This is my pain. And this is, it's my thing. And this is the way it is. And I think, I don't know, maybe there is fear of, to some degree too, what happens if I do get better? What happens if, what happens if, and for some people, they've, you know, especially in today's world, they've joined a forum of people who are all in the same boat, right? And Mm -hmm. if I'm, if I'm, if I'm on the fibromyalgia um, group board, (laughs) can't get better. This is my group. This is my tribe, right? I need to manifest, you know, I don't think it's a conscious thing necessarily, But I see sometimes I think people have a, it's like, I don't know, it's like having a bad partner. They keep dragging it along like, hey, this is my, this is what I'm used to. This is what I know. Um, and sometimes you see that with, with people who are, who've been to a bunch of practitioners, can't get better. You have to start to wonder and now even take a deeper dive into that piece, like what's going on behind the curtain kind of the old Wizard of Oz thing, like what's behind the curtain that's really manifesting as this. If we worked on bugs and organisms and sleep routines and all those things, maybe the emotional piece and the mindset piece is the biggest piece at this point. So what what are things that people can start to, how would you, if you had to give people like, and it's never this simple, but if there was a set of things that somebody could use as a, a habit or a plan on a daily basis to be able to deal with their emotional fitness, what would those skills be that you would yeah. recommend? Yes. I want to give a, uh, at least a couple of practical, tangible things that people can do. Um before I dive into that, for the so that I can keep everyone with us here, for the person who's listening, thinking, what's the goal? Is the goal to just be crying? Like, does this woman just want me walking around in tears? Or do I need to flip tables to demonstrate that I have a broad reach on my emotional experience? Like for the person who's advocating in their minds, like, isn't it good to be even keeled? Do I really want to open up myself to all these emotions? There's a difference between emotional expression an emotional feeling. I'm a lot less concerned about someone's emotional expression. Someone can be sad in a very quiet way or a very loud way that can involve tears. Someone can be angry in a very individual, personal way where they're connecting to themselves, or they can be flipping a table or punching someone. For me, as long as it's healthy and not hurting anyone, I don't care about how you express your emotion. I care that you're feeling it, that you have a conscious awareness of and a somatic connection to the feeling of your feeling. That's what matters in terms of decreasing your nervous system activation. So no, I don't need people flipping tables and crying in business meetings, but I do need to help someone get in touch with the felt sense of their emotions. And I have a couple of things people can practice on a daily or weekly basis to help with that. The first would be something that I call quiet the mind and listen to the body. This will take about 10 minutes. You can practice it every day, a few times a week, and it's meant to help generalize your ability to connect with your feelings. So two parts. Quiet the mind is really simple. I ask people to close their eyes, to draw their attention inward and onto the sensation of the breath. This part feels very similar to a mindfulness meditation Mm -hmm. where you're using the sensation of your breath as your invitation in 
to stillness, to quieting the activity of your mind. Just focus on the sensation of your breathing. This might take two minutes. This might take five minutes. Whenever you feel a sense of calm coming over your body, I want you to shift into, keep your eyes closed and shift into listening to the body mode. You can do this by starting at the top of your head, moving your awareness very slowly and calmly down your body to the soles of your feet as if your awareness was a very slow moving photocopier. And the awareness that we're giving your body, I want you to envision it like it's very warm, gentle light. So a warm, gentle photocopier moving down your entire body. And anytime you hit on a sensation, if you feel sadness behind your, or excuse me, if you feel like a sensation of heaviness behind your eyes or a sensation of tightness in your chest, you don't need to label it. You don't need to figure it out. You don't need to be like, I wonder if that's anger. <laughs> no, there's no thought here. You just non-judgmentally connect with whatever sensation is in your body. If you can practice that in a concentrated way for 10 minutes a day, it will help you as you move into the rest of that day to be a little bit more cognizant of when a sensation comes on. And that's important because emotions are feelings. You feel them somatically in your body. So if you have no idea where to start, start with that. Regulate your nervous system for a couple of minutes. Get that anxiety nervous system level down. Use your breath and then expand your awareness to whatever other sensations you're feeling so that you have this at the top of your mind as you move through the rest of your day. When, like, oh, I did just feel something pop up in my chest. That might be new awareness for people. That's how you start feeling feelings. So when you say feel something pop up, like they may feel heat, they may feel warmth, they may feel what? Because somebody yeah. might be going, what is she talking about, right? Mm -hmm. what is, I can, I get the breathing thing, right? I want to call my breathing, right? Oh. But as, as I'm kind of, and I think the, I think the military does something. I forget what they do to help with sleep, especially under stress hmm. conditions. They're the, they do a, like a 15 minutes body, like oh, scan yeah. of the body. I forget what, uh -huh. I forget the actual process, but maybe it's something similar to what you're talking about. Yeah. Um, but for the person who's never done any of this stuff, never mm -hmm. done breathing or meditation, they may be like, I don't even know what, I, tell me, don't talk to me about emotion. I, I don't even know that I'm feeling emotion or I should yeah. feel emotion or not feel emotion. You're telling me now I'm going to breathe and I'm going to feel something or feel something pop up. What should, what are they going to experience? Maybe mm -hmm. they need to get an idea of what they're going to experience potentially. Yeah, great. So a couple things. The ask is the task. And by that, I mean, we're asking for you to have awareness and attention on your body. That's, you've already won. You've done the task just by asking yourself to have the awareness. It's okay if the first few times you practice this, you're like, I don't know if I felt anything. Like, I don't know what I noticed. I don't know if I noticed the right things. There is no right. You are developing a relationship with your body. And that starts by asking yourself to have awareness on it. What might you actually feel? Sadness can feel like a heaviness. It can feel like a heaviness in your chest. It can feel like a heaviness behind your eyes. Anger often feels like a tension, a warmth, or a heat. Happiness can feel like a jitteriness or a movement or a fluttering. I'm less concerned with you getting the label right. I am more concerned with you being curious about any, any felt sensation in your body because feelings are felt. So if somebody's doing their breathing exercise, they're just, they're maybe they're laying on the floor, maybe they're sitting in their chair and they're kind of going, doing this scan and they feel, oh, I, you know what? I feel a little pressure here mm -hmm. or a little uncomfortable in my abdomen, right? Or maybe there's maybe there's something funny going. On. You don't necessarily, but you just want to be aware of how different parts of the body feel or don't. Yes, yes, and great point. When we're working with people with chronic health stuff, they're also going to bump up on sensations related to their symptoms. Those are different from emotions, right? Your back pain that you feel as a tightness in your back is different from sadness in your stomach. For this exercise, do not worry about classifying the difference because if you hit up on a feeling or if you hit up on a symptom, guess what's gonna help in both of those situations? Calmly attending to the sensation. 
curiously leaning into the sensation without fear and saying, hey, what's here for me? Learning to tolerate felt sensation in your body is helpful regardless of what you bump up on. So as you're learning to kind of do this process, the feeling may, the feel, how do I want to say this? Maybe I, so the feeling, the ache, the pain, the tension, the jittery is going to be, um, it may not be just a physical feeling. It could be more of a emotional feeling. Yeah. Yes. The and more. The, mm-hmm. Yeah. So in the beginning, it may you just maybe feel tension and tightness, but as yeah. you start to go through it, you may start to go. That feels I I feel pre- not a physical pressure, but an emotional pressure, or I feel sad, or I feel whatever, but. If you're not really that in touch or in tune, you may not feel it. It's gonna it may take some time to build a skill set that where you feel some type of emotion around that f- the feeling. Yes. That's okay. exactly it. It might take some time. The first few times you do this, you might just notice your symptoms. If you have back pain, I keep every time I get to my back, I notice my back. Great. Practice responding really calmly and curiously. Again, after you do a few minutes of that basic quieting your mind and focusing on your breath, which is meant to help you start the body scan from a place of lower activation. Maybe after a week of just noticing your back sensation, your body starts to calm down a little bit when you do this. The more you calm your nervous system down, the higher likelihood that you'll be in touch with some other sensations that might be related to feeling. So don't get discouraged. You might, the first couple of times you do this, you might not feel anything, or you might only feel your symptom, your health problem, keep practicing and keep practicing with calm, curious attention. Just be open to other sensations that pop up with practice. If nothing else, you're getting excellent practice, regulating your nervous system and attending to your body in a way that's non-fearful. But somebody could feel sadness. They could feel happiness. They could feel anger. They could feel Loneliness, like any emotional experience, once they start to, if they once they start kind of getting aware of the physical component, they may start to, and they they get a, more aware of that. They may start to get an idea of, hey, there is some emotional, there's something emotionally tied to that as well. Yep. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Yep. All right. So we got that covered. Five to ten minutes a day. We with some breath work. Just kind of do that um, photocopier scan of the body. Just kind of be aware of what the body feel, feels like physically. And then over time, you might start to feel some emotional feeling in, in certain areas as well. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Yeah. What's number two? Okay. Second thing, two parts to this as well. I want you to practice connecting with yourself and connecting with others. And I can give you some examples of both. I want people to feel balanced and in terms of the settings in which they're feeling emotions because it's important for them to have a relationship with themselves. And I also think there is importance in connection and connecting in emotion with other people because that's vulnerability and vulnerability requires lowering your nervous system activation so that you're in feeling and connection with other people. So connecting with yourself Really easy way to do this. If you're like, I don't know, what what are you talking about? What do you mean I have a relationship with myself? You can do this again. Every day is amazing. If you do it a couple times a week, great. Take out a piece of paper, set a timer for 20 minutes, right at the top of the page. How am I doing? With absolutely no pressure on whether you're doing it right, answer that question for the next 20 minutes. How am I doing? It is very unusual for someone to ask themselves, what's coming up for me? If they do not set aside time to practice. What we get very good at is, how are you? How are you? Good, 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 good. I'm fine, I'm fine, how are you? I'm busy, I'm busy, I'm busy, I'm stressed. How are you actually doing though? <laughs> and it could be you're talking about, it starts with, oh, I'm, I don't know, I'm doing fine, I had a busy day at work. You have no idea where you're gonna get to after 20 minutes. And if the first, day, the first couple times you practice, you're like, I don't know if I'm doing this right. Just wait. See what happens as you start developing a relationship with yourself. The first time you ask yourself, you're on a first date with yourself. 
that's it's yeah it's a little uncomfortable you can't really come up with things to say you're kind of shuffling your feet what happens when you're on, on your second date or in your second week well now i've been doing this for months this is how you start developing an emotional relationship with yourself so i really encourage that 20 minutes absolutely no right or wrong just get that pen to paper or you can do you can even do because some people are like oh, i don't want to <laughs> pens are outdated apparently get your phone out you can do 20 minutes of a voice note on your phone it doesn't there's no um there is no right or wrong way journaling can even be spoken journaling can be something can be verbal yeah so journaling and i talk about this in my book i talk about it with clients and the one thing that you said um is the most common thing that i hear i don't even know what to write mm -hmm. right yes, Right. right. Exactly. Sit with that discomfort. Sit with yeah. not knowing yourself. Right. So I don't know what to write, so I'm not doing it. Right. Again, another, I, I, I and it, the way I look at it is if you're, that should be a sign to you that you're avoiding something. Right. 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 Cause, right. Cause I don't even want to write it down. Right. I don't even, I have nothing to write down. Really. You have nothing, <laughs> yeah. you have nothing to, to talk about, Hey, this is what's going good for me. Yeah. Right. And I think Chris's point is just right. It doesn't matter what it is. Just write whatever's in your mind, whatever's in your brain and get used to it. Once you get good at, at starting to kind of dump your brain onto paper, mm -hmm. it gets easier and you never know what's going to come out of that stuff. Just let it go where it goes. Mm -hmm. You may be like, I don't even know what that means or what that says. Great out of your brain right? <laughs> it's, it's and some point you may come back and go oh huh, how about that but i think it's one of those things that people are when they when people uh, that usually is a clue for me when somebody's like nah, nah, nah I, don't, I don't do that because i don't want i don't i don't need i don't it's stupid right what okay that's a person who's probably got some emotional fitness issues um and but i and it doesn't hurt but yet i think it's it's avoidance right it's somebody's mm -hmm not willing to dump their emotions out there and start to take inventory of what they're repressing or suppressing either yes. one. and uh man i think it's i think for a lot of people it can be super liberating to just dump out of their brain what's going on and i think one of the best times to do this especially for the person who has trouble sleeping at night is right before you go to bed mm. like i call mm -hmm. it an after action report is like, Hey, at the end of the day, how'd the day go? Right. If you're, if you're a person who starts the day with, Hey, these are the things I want to get accomplished today, the, you know, make a lift or do those things. That's great. But at the end of the day, and I think I got this from my brother who's in the military after every mission, you know, they do an after action report, like what happened? How did it go? What did we learn? What's the benefit? What went wrong? How can we change it? And just dump all that stuff out. So I think you could do that. Even if you don't know what to, write about anything, you could do something like that. Like, how did my day go? What was my wins? What was the things that didn't get accomplished? What do I need to do for tomorrow? Because if you think too many of us have, it's it's a freaking shit show going on in their brain and they lay down at night and all of that stuff is separating around in their brain and they wonder why they can't sleep or well, their mind can't calm down. But if you can just take that stuff out and dump it onto paper, Man, I think it's liberating and you don't have to be super, but like, I got to remember that for tomorrow. I got to remember that for tomorrow. Well, there's probably no chance you're going to sleep, right? Big time. After action report. That's amazing. I love that. So we got two things down. One is the, is the body scan, five to 10 minutes of a body scan every day to be, to gain awareness, awareness of what's going on. Um, the second thing is start journaling. Right. And kind of just dump feelings, thoughts, emotions out on the paper. Uh, no rights, no wrongs. What's number three? Yeah. So this is where I want to challenge people to start connecting with others. We're biologically designed to attach to other people and to feel feelings in connection with others. This can be done in baby steps or in bigger steps. So I want to challenge everyone, but let's try to hit at least once a week to be in honest connection, in honest feeling with others. This could look baby step. The next time someone asks, how are you? Actually answer them. <laughs> actually let them know how you're doing. Do you have to choose your boss? No, choose a friend. Choose the next time you feel someone safe-ish to you. Ask, 
how are you doing? Actually answer them. That counts. You're in connection with someone else. You are sharing honestly about what's coming up for you. Slightly bigger step might be choosing a friend or maybe your partner, husband, wife, where once a week you should say, hey, do you have the bandwidth for me bringing up what's coming up for me this week? I want to run something by you. I'm like, I'm going through something right now. Can I share that? Can you be with me in that? Do that once a week. Great. That's a purposeful, intentional connection with others. Even bigger step, maybe you want to go all in. You want a counseling relationship with someone. You want to carve out 50 minutes a week where you can totally be in, be in your emotion. Any or all of those steps and anywhere in between where you are practicing not, to, again, you're taking that relationship you're building with yourself and now you're saying, I want to expand my exposure. I want to make this a little, uh, a little bit harder, but the payoff is even greater for me to be in connection with someone else in my feeling. That validation that you get can get from someone else is incredibly good for our nervous systems. Absolutely. And, and uh, I think one of those things, and this is your world, so correct me if I'm wrong, but when you're going to have that community, connection where you're going to kind of un, kind of kind of release some of that stuff to somebody it's a, i my my thought process uh, even though it's hard for me to not do it is when i when when somebody's doing that to me i want to fix it for them and tell them what to do and really the person who you're dumping to their job is not to tell you what to do and how to fix it their job is more to to listen and reassure, but yeah, I could be wrong. How do you, how, how do you get that person when you're telling somebody, Hey, this is what you want to do. Do they set rules, grab some ground rules with the person they're dumping mm -hmm. onto, or what do you tell them? Nice. Oh, music to my ears. Yes. Feelings are meant to be felt, shared, felt, not fixed. When we start going into fixing, and again, doesn't mean you can't ever take action, but for the purpose of what we are doing here, getting you more comfortable with feeling feelings, they're meant to be felt, not fixed. Fixing implies thinking, implies planning, prefrontal cortex coming online. No, no, no. Now we're getting into thinking. These are not thinking, they are feeling. So absolutely, it is about sitting with someone in uncomfortable feelings and fighting the urge to go into cognitive planning action mode. Awesome. All right. I think that was three good tips. We can end with those three great tips. Uh, I think there's a lot more on this to eat, to discuss and talk about. So I'll probably look to get you back again and we'll have a, a different conversation, maybe one with some skill sets around different things like, you know, like a specific thing like, hey, certain condition or something like food sensitivities, food intolerance, food fear. That's one of the biggest things we see in functional mm -hmm. medicine. And we sometimes create it for our patients by putting them on restrictive diets or sensitive to this or sensitive to that. And people live in a world of food fear uh, and that creates more issues. So that may be a great topic to maybe bring you back and have a discussion with. But tell everybody if they want to, if they have some interest in hearing more about what you do and your team do, where can they find out more about you? I'd love to connect with people and I'm happy to send people. I should have mentioned this with a body scan. People can reach out. I'm happy to send them a guided audio of a body scan if people want to practice that. But to find me in general, bettermindcenter.com. My group is called the Better Mind Center. We work with people. Um, we're local to Los Angeles, but we work with people all around the world or on Instagram. I'm better.with.christy on Instagram. Awesome. Well, Christy, thanks so much for coming on the Thyroid Answers podcast. I'll let you get back to your, your day and your life. Uh, and hopefully we can get you back on a future episode. This has been so fun. Thank you so much. You bet.